Welcome back once again to SLMA Radio and this week's program, Outstanding Outbound, a monthly show with our host, Marianne Vanilla Hosting. Marianne, as you know, has been a frequent guest here in the past on the SLMA, and her new program will explore the growing field of outbound lead generation for large deals, maybe like yours. Program's brought to you by the Vanilla Group. Without any further ado, let's welcome Marianne Vanilla. Hey, Marianne. Hey, Paul. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Outstanding outbound. Boy, I, I, uh, I, I smile every time I say that because is there such a thing as outstanding outbound where uh, so much of the outbound is just garbage, it seems like? It's really funny because I actually put this tagline in one of my profiles just today. I said, it's not that people don't take calls. They just don't take bad calls. Yes, exactly. And and there's a lot of bad calls out there. A lot of them. Yeah, really bad. And I think a lot of times organizations think that, you know, putting junior people on the front lines to cut their teeth on before they can get into large account management and things like that. But really what they do is those are often the people that are first talking with new prospects. And it just makes the thing crash on the very first interaction they have with them. it really does and I, I know you got a guest waiting here but i just got to bring up one one uh, p pet peeve of mine they're all following this standard script when they when they when you answer the phone and so you weren't right. expecting a sales call and all of a sudden they say hi mr roberts how are you right. like that's supposed to engage me immediately and all it does is immediately tell me it's a sales call i didn't ask for and i'm annoyed right and even calling you Mr. Roberts, it's like, okay, why don't you put your teacher on the phone? <laughs> yes, exactly, right. A lot of times reps that are inexperienced, they kind of make this immediate class distinction by talking up to their prospect. So it creates this lack of respect that you can't even have a peer-to-peer discussion when you do that. Yeah, well, I look forward to hearing more about can there be such a thing as outstanding outbound because it seems like we're just getting worse and worse at it. It's getting more robotic. I'm less and less likely to even want to engage with them after the first second. As soon as I find out what that it is, I'm annoyed and I want to quit. Right, yeah. So, yeah, like talk like a normal person. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, today my guest is Dan Sixsmith, and he owns a consulting firm, Sales is King Performance Consulting, and he's also CMO at Augmento Agency. So he's a, a well-known consultant, speaker, trainer, coach. He's a very active blogger. He serves as a CMO on a board of a nonprofit organization. They um, work with protecting teens from substance abuse, and, and he talks a lot about that personally, you know, to help out kids. And so today, what we're going to talk about is what sales leadership is in denial about. So I want to welcome Dan. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, I'm really, uh, really exciting to have you. I know you and I have talked a lot about <laughs> different stuff that is just really broken on enterprise sales teams in that B2B space. And you and I were talking about the show and the areas that we're going to get into are things that are so often overlooked, but really need to be looked at to stop losing deals for ridiculous reasons. And, And a lot of this stuff just persists. And it's so hard to get everyone to slow down and just re-engineer some of their workflow and some of their management processes. And I see this happen over and over, and companies add more tools and more reps and more data platforms. But the same stuff is happening behind the curtain. So what do you think are the three biggest areas that sales leadership is missing the mark on? You're absolutely right. And just kind of piggybacking on what you guys said at the beginning, only 17% of reps actually get a second meeting. So that just goes to show how bad the performances are. But it does come back to the sales leadership. And I think there's three key areas where they're missing. First and foremost, they're hiring the wrong people. There was a stat from the objective management group that said leaders are hiring sales, the wrong salespeople 77% of the time. So they really need to kind of focus on what skills they really are looking for when they hire salespeople so they can get the hire right. So that's step right. one. They're hiring the wrong people. Step two, once they hire them, I think they're doing a poor job of training and coaching them. 
and holding them accountable. I think they kind of just throw them out there and hope they know what they're doing, and they don't give them effective training. And then from there, they don't really coach them on an ongoing basis. And then I think number three would be, are the sales leaders holding themselves accountable? It's very easy to dump on the salespeople and say, hey, the quota numbers have been going down, and this this rep blew this deal. But ultimately, they have to answer for this. So how do they hold themselves more accountable? How can they become better leaders, better managers, better coaches? Right. Yeah, and to your the second point of training, yeah, I know a lot of times when reps are onboarded, they get some product training, they get all their you know sales enablement stuff and all their pitch decks and maybe some battle cards and stuff like that. But as far as how to engage with people on a personal level and how to interpret their behavior and how to be able to read the conversation. Like I do a lot of work around that remote relationship management and how do you manage these relationships that you're mainly having interactions with over the phone or on email or web calls or you know video calls or whatever. How do you how do you convert what you were doing in person, which was more, you know, you take them out for dinner, or, you know, you, you've got something that is more substantial, like, oh, let's go play golf, let's go do this, whatever. And how do you create the value of that in remote touch? That's something that prospects just don't know. And I think that a lot of times they might know the product, they might know the tools that they have available, but they don't really understand the psychology of their buyers in a way that they can kind of read between the lines and know how to get in there a little more surgically. It's interesting. So how how is this happening? I want to ask you this. How, how is this happening at a time where transparency is so easy? We can see what's going on in CRMs. We can see who's hitting our sites real time. There's so much visibility. So why do you think this is still happening? I think there's really a major shift going on in sales. And, and I make the contention that B2B sellers are being disrupted. The sales process is really being disrupted. And those who are not making the change are going to fall by the wayside, you know, like the companies that have it, like the Blockbusters and the Sears, Robux, Sports Authorities, right? So there's all this information about how buyers want to engage today, and it's different than it was years ago. The new modern seller needs to know how to do the homework, how to do the research, and then engage and ask thoughtful questions, you know, intelligent questions that are going to get the prospect to open up and then try and make a connection between how they can help their solution connected to the prospect issue or challenge. And that's not easy to do for sellers today because the old school is, hey, we go in, we throw up a PowerPoint, we talk about our solution, we go through the features and benefits, and then we just pray that something sticks or that something resonates. So there's really a sea change in how to sell effectively today. And if the sales leaders can't teach the sales reps how to do this, then it's all going to fall on deaf ears, and I think that's why the numbers are so bad today. Yeah, and, you know, the thing is, a lot of these outcomes that happen on the front lines, I, I find that they're not really examined with a view of what needs to change. It's kind of more of a, well, what's a poor mortem on this? Okay, let's move on. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I think a lot of the leaders are, uh, the sales leaders have come up with kind of pipeline management There's not a lot of riding along. There's not a lot of breaking down the calls, analyzing where things may have gone wrong. And it's everything's happening so quickly that everyone's just running to the next meeting. And then hoping at the end of the year, we say, oh, well, we had a good year. I hope. What happened? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I know. And some of this stuff is so basic. How you follow up and engagement practices, the words you use, how to construct an email. I mean, it's really basic stuff that can make a prospect go quiet. One of my peeves, I wrote a LinkedIn article about sending your calendar invite, your calendar in cold emails and other slop and B2B sales. And I think that sending a calendar link for prospects to do the work to get a meeting on a rep's calendar, I mean, it just sets a weird dynamic. And you know, a lot of prospects aren't going to respond to that. I don't respond to that. It's like, you want to sell me your stuff, you do the work to make the meeting happen. It's like, I'm not going to adjust to when you're available. Me personally, they got to do the work. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I, I, I've seen that. And, and what it says is, is that like, hey, I'm more important than you. 
Uh, right. You do the work. You book the meeting. You come find me. Uh, what should I do next? Write my own proposal and then send you a check. I tell our folks to always add value. In every interaction, add value. Don't be a pest. Send a, a piece of interesting content as follow-up to see where right. people are in the process. Just differentiate yourself. It's so easy to do because there's so much bad activity going on out there. You know, yeah, just come yeah. across intelligent, thoughtful, and, and I think you're going to do, do a lot better than most. Yeah, and the thing is, to your point, everything's moving so fast that it is a stretch sometimes to do the extra work, to stop, look back, what happened. But if you do that, if you just take the time to roll up your sleeves and find out what's happening, then you really get it. That's where you get the insight that you need, because then you can see where stuff falls apart, because it's not just, you know, I have an illustration about follow up that. Well, let me ask you this first. I'll, I'll give you that example, because it's really funny on some of the follow ups that I get. But why, why do you think that organizations are resistant to look at that? I think that, uh, first of all, a lot of the sales leadership, they rise through the ranks uh, and they're really good at selling. And then they start to take over teams and they're not particularly good at leading, managing, coaching, analyzing all of the key skills that are required today to be able to understand what's going on in your business. And then in turn, train your team to do that. So I think the quality of sales leadership needs to be better. And I think the leaders need to be trained. The CEOs and and the higher ups need to provide training for, you know, effective sales management as a modern digital era manager. Right. Who are some people that you know that are doing it right? Like what are some success stories? Yeah. So I, I, you know, I've uh, come across a few companies over the last couple of years. Hey, Dan, um, we're going to break. We're going to break for a commercial in a second. I'm going to ask you that question when you come back, because I really want to talk about that, because I know we're kind of ripping on what everybody's doing that's wrong. But (laughs) there's actually a lot of organizations that are doing it right. And when you experience that, it really makes a difference. So I'm going to hand it back over to Paul. And we're going to go to commercial break. And I'll be right back. And just to take a breather here and uh, remind you that the Vanilla Group is committed to give back to our customers more than just great leads. That's it. Their objective is to deliver a customized strategic sales development solution that's sustainable. Isn't that the key? It's got to be something you can do over and over again. The Vanilla Group's solution is designed to invigorate your entire sales organization by providing your sales team with new revenue opportunities and a continuous stream of ongoing selling activities. Continuous, sustainable. Achieving this mission requires a partnership. And as your trusted partner, the Vanilla Group understands your objectives and tries to meet your requirements. For more information on what seems like a simple and obvious but very powerful premise, premise, uh, you can visit the website at thevanillagroup.com. Dot com v a n e l l a group dot com vanilla group dot com. Every time I read that, I say that's so obvious, but so few people do that. We're, we're nobody's doing anything sustainable, continuous. Isn't that what we're trying to achieve here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of it is you know turnover, and I mean, we've had clients anywhere from four to ten years. And that's because it's predictable. So that's really key. We last a lot longer than their FTEs do. And Uh, and what I and I'm I'm sure you'll talk more about this and maybe a little bit today. You should talk about the positive things. You you were bashing on everybody the first half here. But I think that one of the things that's missing. We all think that we have to simplify it and dumb it down, like we were talking about scripts at the beginning. Or hi, Mr. Roberts, how are you? Everybody's got to follow this simple pattern. And I'm not sure that that's really what works. I think if you dumb it down enough, you 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 kill the golden goose here you stop the continuous growth here right well what you really need to do is not dumb it down but you need to step it up i Ah. mean you got to have people that can have really sharp critical thinking skills on the front lines you got to have people that understand how to map what's going on in these accounts to actionable items and how to map that so that they can pivot their discussions and get the information that they need to be able to progress the deal. So I think a lot of people are kind of in this 
pushing information. Yeah, right. Really what you need to do is pull information. And so, Dan, I just asked you, who's doing it right? Why don't you name a few examples? Yeah, sure. So to be fair to some of the sales leaders, they are running around putting out fires, right? So organizations are layering in these sales enablement functions, groups that are coming in to work with the sales leaders, to work with the sales team, to train and coach. So over the last couple of years, I've worked with a few different companies. First Union is doing a great job. Chris Kingman and his team, they put in very elaborate training and coaching and education that is repeated. You know, the whole thing about this is consistency, right? Companies will bring in trainers, right? And they do this fabulous training and then everybody runs off into the sunset and seven days later, they've forgotten it all. So they have these consistent coaching programs where the reps are constantly being evaluated. Um, People are listening into their calls because a lot of their business is done on the phone. They're reviewing the calls. They're breaking down the calls. They're trying to help them and talk to them about where they can improve what they need to do better, or where they've, where they've been going well. Ring Central is another one. Siobhan Thatcher and her group, they're in the unified communication space and B2B. They've put together a similar program. Pegasystems as well. You really have to invest in the people, in the training, in the coaching, and make it an ongoing and consistent process. And then you start to see it become kind of a culture, right? So there's a culture of learning, a culture of yeah. coaching a culture of sharing best practices. That's how people get better. Right. So those are a few examples that I think people are are doing a great job. Yeah, no, that's great. Like I said, there's a ton of people that are doing it right. You know, they look at the sales operations function. So whether they have somebody in that role or not, sales operations is a function. You have to get in there and look at, okay, what step happening here? Gary Gross is operations guru that I know. And he's got a really, really tight infrastructure that he overlays on to organizations he works with. And there's nothing falling through the cracks there. So it really makes a difference because you can see that there's not all these blind spots that are going on. And you're right. A lot of it is just being busy. Quotas are you know, growing. And one of the things I mentioned, we were just featured in Silicon Valley Review. And one of the things, or Silicon Review, sorry, uh, one of the things that I mentioned is that the vendor space is more crowded. Therefore, there's more teams, there's more outreach. So there's a lot of noise out there. So the pressure on reps is huge, but there are things happening which are totally unnecessary. For example, I had one It was an enterprise, big company. All of you know who it is. I won't say it. And (laughs) that we needed to buy something from them. And I inquired and we bought their platform. But they had SDRs following up on that initial lead months after we already bought the platform. Talk about broken. Obviously, their CRM isn't integrated with their automation with their forms, with all this other stuff. Maybe they're using a third party to do that. I don't know. But that's a really big deal. So broken process is something that that's when you go and you audit your trail of the customer journey. That's where you can find that stuff. So if you were going to give sales leaders three things that they can look at before the end of the year, that's going to really help supercharge their 2019. What are what are those three things? Yeah, so they really need to uh, go back and analyze the year, right, and see what what was good and what was bad. But number one, they have to decide what skills they're looking for in their sales reps going forward and then hire the right people, hire the people that fit that description. There was an article in Fast Company recently that asked the question, is sales moving to become more of a STEM job, science, technology, engineering, and math? It is. You know, it it is starting to move that way. So the old school, hey, this guy's a great guy, let me hire him, or a great gal, or, you know, the word experience to me doesn't mean much anymore. Expertise is much more important. I've got 30 years experience in selling, but the way I sold in 1989, if I sold today, I wouldn't be doing very well. Right. For people with expertise, number one. Um, Number two, we've got to train and coach better. We've got to learn how to train and coach. How can I make my team the best possible team that they can be. And then number three is going to be, I, as a sales leader, I've got to hold myself accountable. And guess what? If my company is not giving me training or education, I've got to get that on my own. 
I've got to go yeah. out and hire a mentor. I've got to go read a book. I've got to go listen to podcasts. I've got to watch videos. I have to improve in these areas. I've got to go do that on my own. And I've got to, yeah. I've got to take full responsibility for what went right and also what went wrong. Yeah, those are great points. And I see this a lot with sales reps. Like when I interview people to add to our team, I'll ask, you know, what are some of the business books that you've read recently? And a lot of them haven't read anything, or a lot of them don't have anybody that has mm-hmm. really stood out to them in the space. And that tells me a little bit about them. And I know it, just the, the whole idea of listening and uh, you know having those types of skills and being able to solve problems. And how did you solve a problem like this? How did you address a customer like that? When did you go above and beyond what was really the scope of your role to be able to help a client when they were having a problem? You know, those types of things are meaningful because that'll tell you how much they're going to personally invest in themselves to get better. Because just like you were saying, If you were selling like you were 15 years ago or whatever, it's like it's not the same today. You have to understand the digital landscape and you have to understand that information is out there. You can find out on your own. You don't have to chew up time with your prospect discovering things that you can find out on your own. So that's really, really important. So, Dan, how can people follow you and engage with you? Sure. Sure. So um, I've got a podcast called Sales is King which is um, available on all the major platforms, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Anchor.fm. I've been doing that for about a year and a half. We've got 71 episodes, and we go through a lot of these issues. Sometimes we interview players from the field. Other times we're just kind of breaking down some of the latest trends. And a lot of these issues that we're wrestling with today, you could shoot me a note at dan.sixsmith at Gmail, and I'm on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter at Digital Advantage. Yeah, I really appreciate you guys having me on today. It was a great conversation. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I really appreciate it. I will hand it back over to Paul. You've been listening to another episode of Outstanding Outbound with host Marianne Vanilla. Brought to you by the Vanilla Group and Funnel Radio Channel for at-work listeners like you. 